Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar of the Institute for International and European Affairs in Dublin. Um, my name is Peter Gunning. I'm a member of the Institute, and it's my pleasure to host uh, today's presentation and discussion with uh, Bruno Masayas, whom I'll introduce in a moment. Just on the arrangements for the, the talk and the questions today, Mr. Masayas will speak to us for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then we'll move to a question and answer session uh, with the audience and both the presentation and the Q&A will be on the record. You'll be able as an audience to join the uh, Q&A using the Q&A function on Zoom, which should appear on your screen. Uh, please uh, feel free to send in your questions throughout the session and we'll come to them in due course. Uh, it'd be helpful if with your question, you would identify yourself and any affiliation uh, you may have. You can also join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So Bruno Masayas uh, was educated at the University of Lisbon, Lisbon from where he speaks to us today, and at Harvard from where he has a doctorate in international relations. He's currently at, uh, a senior advisor at Flint Global, where he advises some of the world's leading companies on geopolitics, and technology. He's a senior fellow at the Wilfrid Martins Center for European Studies. Mr. Masayas is a thinker and the author of several books, including Belt and Road, The Chinese World Order, History Has Begun, The Birth of a New America, and The Dawn of Eurasia on the Trail of the New World Order. His latest book is entitled Geopolitics for the End Time, from the pandemic to the climate crisis. And this is the theme of his address to the IIEA today. I should add that Bruno also knows well the political side of the challenges uh, facing us these days, having served as uh, Portugal's Secretary of State for European Affairs for a number of years from 2013. It was in that capacity indeed that he addressed the IIEA in person back in 2014. So Bruno, welcome back to Dublin, even if only virtually, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Peter. I wish I could be in Dublin, and I have very fond memories of that event where I talked about a Euro crisis, but all that seems very much in the past, and we have new challenges now. The books uh, that I wrote over the past four years and that you, you mentioned are all about, are all attempts to detect change as it is happening in our world. It could be in the global distribution of power with the rise of China or the, the rise of a revisionist Russia. It could be the election of Donald Trump, uh, to which in a way my book on America is, uh, was inspired by, uh, or it could be the pandemic or the climate crisis. Uh, I see the, the current moment as a moment of profound change in the structure of the global system. And interestingly, the theories we have are the exact opposite. The main ways we have of understanding the world are theories of conclusion, definitiveness, uh, of stasis in a way. When you think about uh, Fukuyama and the end of history, it's, uh, it's the opposite of a theory of change. When you think about Huntington's clash of civilizations, it's the opposite of a theory of change. It's a theory of how we are stuck in this world of very old ancient civilizations and keep on, on fighting each other. So actually my, my next book will, will be a little slightly more academic than, than these uh, four books. And I'll try to develop a competing uh, paradigm uh, uh, explaining how we can make sense of the change happening all around us. And today I'll just make some brief comments uh, about a certain way to interpret and to bring together different dynamics of change today. And I'll, I'll have some comments about first the technology wars, second the pandemic and third climate change. Uh, some noise now in the background, I hope it's not a problem. Uh, I would have to change inside, but hopefully it's, it's not a problem. So uh, what is really happening, I think, if we, if we look at these different stories and how they come together, is that um, many of the things of, of the stable elements in our world are coming undone. And the, our power to transform 
the global landscape uh, is increasing every day uh, along different dimensions. And so we're left uh, in a world that, that in a way is being reconstructed as we speak. Uh, and, and, and that uh, is, I think, the background for many of the crises that we are discussing. If we think about the technology wars, the Huawei question, let me put it that way. What was really behind it? It wasn't just economic competition. It wasn't just industrial policy. If you look at the American reaction to the rise of Huawei and other successful Chinese companies, there was a lot of economic anxiety. Is America still leading? Are we still the technological leaders? Uh, do we have a threat from China? But there was a lot more than that. There was a sense that companies like Huawei and others would be able to rebuild the world, to create a new networked global landscape, a technological one, based on new communications technologies, 5G, the internet of things, and that this world would be built by China. I find lots of comments about, we cannot live in a world that China will build. So there was an, an anxiety about China, but there was also an anxiety about a new moment in history where technology is now so advanced that we are no longer fighting for territory. We are building the territory. This virtual world of telecommunication and technology is being built from scratch. And the question is, who will build it? And who will have to live in a world built by others? There's a particularly uh, suggestive moment when suddenly our anxieties are even bigger and larger than before. Then the pandemic hit and you see similar dynamics because what the pandemic, I've more and more come to the conclusion that the best way to interpret the pandemic is a great moment of artificiality. Suddenly we retreated from the natural world, we migrated to the world of Zoom, to the world of telemedicine, to the world of tele-entertainment. Uh, we created behavior rules that uh, were as, uh, far removed from normal natural life as, as could be imagined. Uh, we developed uh, new technologies for surveillance and digital contact tracing, which in many societies, particularly in East Asia, uh, really uh, created almost a, a parallel uh, digital system tracking individuals. Uh, one, one Chinese theorist even talks about the digitization of people. People were now digital points in a global system of surveillance. So again, a great drive towards artificiality, towards a, a technological world that is built separate from the natural world. Uh, vaccines, uh, it's not just that uh, we relied on vaccines to put an end to the pandemic for the first time in history. Every other pandemic, vaccines uh, appeared at the end, the sort of mopping up exercise. But this time around, vaccines were absolutely critical to actually put an end to the pandemic. And we can barely imagine what the consequences would have been if vaccines had not been around. And not just vaccines, but new technologies that really point towards a new moment where we can manipulate human biology and make it resistant to natural threats and the natural world in a way that never happened before. mRNA vaccines are really a form of uh, genetic technology, and this has created resistance in some quarters, but obviously, in my view, it should be applauded and points towards incredible possibilities, for example, to develop universal vaccines against every coronavirus uh, and really uh, uh, allow us to create new barriers between a dangerous uh, natural world and the human world that we inhabit, which is in the process becoming more and more uh, delinked from from the natural world. So again, in the case of the pandemic, we have this drive towards what those who are uh, interested in, in, in literature and, and fantasy, what in, in, in that context is called world building. Uh, Tolkien's idea of world building, that you create a world from scratch. And in the pandemic, we were all engaged in forms of world building. China was building its own world and America was building its, its, its own world, but in, in both cases separating from the natural world. Uh, the same dynamics that we had seen with the technology wars, I believe. Uh, and uh, 
uh, in many respects, this created during the pandemic, the same uh, process of uh, strategic competition that we saw before. Because suddenly in this world of technological construction uh, and artificiality, we are losing touch with the sense of a natural world, a natural economy of human needs that still brought different systems together. What was globalization over the past few decades, if not the idea that independently of what the regime and the ideology is in China and what the regime and ideology is in the West, that we share something more or less fundamental, what Adam Smith would call a system of natural needs, there's production, there's consumption, there's some uh, uh, universal factors about uh, how one connects supply with demand and how production is organized. All this system of natural needs is coming undone because we no longer live in a world that can be called natural. And each powerful actor in the global system is building its own system, but it's no longer a system of natural needs. What we're seeing in the global supply chain is really the breaking apart of that. But fundamental, I think, philosophically at the bottom, we have this process of increasing artificiality. It's not Huntington's clash of civilizations. It's certainly not Fukuyama's end of history. What we have is actually a kind of a new beginning where we are becoming unnatural creatures in an unnatural world. The technolo technology wars show that. The pandemic, in my view, this is the best way to think about the pandemic in a way that sort of makes sense of everything that happened over the past uh, two years. And now if we turn briefly to climate change, it's a sort of corollary culmination of this. With climate change, I don't think we have the consequences of uh, artificiality of a technological world. What we have is most likely in the large historical uh, outlook, uh, what we have is in fact the beginning of, of the Anthropocene, the beginning of a world that is built from scratch by human beings. Uh, increasingly, we're seeing that the response to climate change is moving towards ideas of geoengineering, of increased control of the natural environment, together with very powerful ways of adaptation. Uh, and they, uh, the process is going to be competitive. Every major block will be called upon to respond to climate change. And they won't respond through a kind of disarmament. They won't respond by renouncing some elements of technological power. That I believe is an illusion. They will respond by developing new forms of technological power, ways of controlling the climate as China is developing, ways of protecting your coastline against uh, the, the ravages of climate change. Worlds in many world cities to uh, uh, project their own city as better place to fight climate change. If during the pandemic, we saw cities like Dubai and Singapore being able to tell the world, we know how to do this, and why don't you consider moving here? And many people did to Dubai, including myself. And I was impressed by the way that the city dealt with climate change, with, with the pandemic. With climate change, we'll see something similar. Many of these cities are actually not favored by geography or latitude, but they are already actively projecting an image of we have the resources and the ability and the collective drive to uh, uh, to respond to climate change through widespread use of air conditioning, through landscaping, uh, through technology that uh, uh, releases is from the need for long commutes, a long painful commutes, and in a transformed climate. This is what Singapore is doing, and. Uh, we'll see it in, in many other places. We already see these very strong competitive dynamics in play. Secretary of State Blinken said uh, about a year ago that the United States can only win uh, the competition with China if it becomes a leader in climate change. And this was not rhetoric. 
This is coming from China as well. China announced ambitious climate goals precisely because it believes this is in many respects where the competition for the 21st century will be decided. In some sense, who will be better able to resist the impact of climate change? This is sort of the negative side of the question. Who will show more resilience? Uh, similar to the pandemic, who will be able to come out on top, uh, knowing full well that the ravages will be profound and the disruption will be profound and who will be more resilient. But then there's a positive side to this. We all anticipate that at the end of this tunnel, at the end of this process, at the end of this climate transition, and we're talking about the rest of the century, that it will be living in an entirely new world with a different technological paradigm, with a different energy paradigm that we are going through uh, another technological energy revolution. Uh, and more profound than the previous ones. And curiously, when we look at the previous ones, we see that they were very uh, closely aligned with changes in global power. Uh, there's some literature on this, and uh, I'd, I'd like to see more, but uh, I, when I look at uh, how the Britain came to dominate the world system in the late 18th century and then in the 19th century, was this because you won the seven year war against France or was it fundamentally because it knew how to master the new energy technologies of the first industrial revolution, steam in particular. Uh, it, it, it fully embraced those technologies and was able you know, both to create a new world. It's the world after the first industrial revolution of coal and steam was no longer uh, recognizable, create a new world. And as, as the creator of this new world, having rights also to lead and manage it. And then when it's changed, it changed because America, the United States, in a way replicated the process with the second industrial revolution, with electricity, oil. Again, a fundamental transition to a new world. And the United States is both uh, the creator of this new world and its, its manager. And in China today, you see uh, ideas uh, that uh, try to draw lessons from, from this history and that see a great opportunity uh, in the climate transition that we are going through, that will emerge at the end with a world that will no longer be recognizable, that no longer de depends on, on fossil fuel energy, uh, where new uh, unimaginable in some cases, technologies will be universally deployed. And if China is able to lead and manage this transition, then it will come out on top as Britain and the United States did. And there's actually some cause of optimism for Chinese strategists in these reflections, because if you believe, like many IR academics do, that fundamental changes in global power are the result of great wars, of uh, so-called hegemonic, hegemonic wars, then um, the prospects for a fundamental change in the global system that places China on top are very reduced because in the age of uh, nuclear weapons, these uh, fundamental hegemonic wars look more or less impossible. It's a topic I develop at some length in, in my latest book. But if you believe that changes in the global hierarchy of power are not the result of great wars, but the result of fundamental transformations in what I call in the book, the technological order. And this technological order is deeply connected to new energy sources. Then China can look to the future with more optimism because it might be possible for a transition to a new global order to happen surreptitiously, let us say, through the development of a new technological order rather than through a direct clash and war between the previous Agamon and the aspiring Agamon. Another reason why the Thucydides trap might be entirely misguided as a way to understand what is happening. And interesting, I'll stop with this because there may even be questions about it. Uh, Russia <coughs> clearly is, has taken the, the other tack that Russia, Putin uh, sees the, the last decade of his rule as a, as a, a, a is a long dreamed about and, and, and long conceived and planned attempt to transform the global order, but he's doing it in the, in, in the sort of uh, 
classical way of through a through a direct clash, through a militarized diplomacy where the possibility of a new great war in Europe is used in order to force a new Yalta and therefore a redrawing, a redesigning of the global rules and, and the global order. Uh, I believe he's stopping short of the idea that it is at the end of a destructive war that this new world can be built. He knows that we live in a world of nuclear weapons and, and, and that it's, uh, uh, that's not a path that can be chosen. But I think he's, he's tempted by the possibility that just a threat of a great war might be enough to bring the current Agamemnon and aspiring states to the table in a kind of new Yalta to redesign the security order. In Europe. China, for all the comparisons between Russia and China, China is a very different view of these things. Uh, it's based on uh, the slow growth of a new economic and technological order that China aspires to be. But that's the world we live in of, of great changes and uh, not just of the appearance of a new world, but actually, as I said at the beginning, this may be the first moment in history where human beings start to think of themselves as living in an entirely artificial world. And in my view, it's this artificiality that helps us bring together this disparate strands of change in the contemporary world, which is what I've been trying to do in my book to try to bring them together. And finally, I've, I've chosen this opportunity to try to present some of the ideas that I'm working on right now. Finally, I've, I've come to the conclusion that it's the sense of artificiality of world building that provides, in my view, a much needed general paradigm under which these different uh, uh, changes and, and, and strands of transformation can be brought together. Stop here, 20 minutes uh, in and looking forward to the questions.